and that's a it's a powerful combination to have in the chart it's um a combination where at worst it could be too evangelical too righteous too i'm driven by the word of the law you know, the lord the law every, you know whatever it may be there's a sense of um uh, i'm here to do right and in the right hands or in moderation that can be very helpful uh, with jupiter there's often little in moderation um mars jupiter would suggest huge energy having the courage of your convictions um being um you know powerfully driven with your aims and your ambitions and your desires uh um it um i've got here getting away with anything yeah sometimes with mars jupiter um it's got the audacity and at the same time um the ability to just uh, uh walk away untouched unharmed with it all um so yes yeah yeah um anyway so um anybody got mars jupiter that they want to mention or talk about Go on, Maria, give us some information. You've got the trine, okay. Okay, well, give us a few ideas of what do you, how you work with that. Okay. Is it the center, the energetic center of your chart, perhaps? Yeah, is it? What does it represent? how do you use it where do you put that energy yeah these are okay all right i'm suspicious now okay with all of that um levain says um i have to check myself when taking action okay yes you could um jump in too fast as melody ann says thank you um you notice when you're spun out trying to relax yes maybe that you're always busy doing always busy trying to achieve or something always got a future goal future jupiter goal mars you know these are important things to recognize um it's important with mars jupiter to chill out when you need to yeah but it's also good to fight your preconceptions your belief system you may want to fight other people's belief systems you know that may be a waste of energy for some or you might um you might want to challenge your own you know i've been doing this recently a lot where um the simple idea of if i'm finding myself irritated by something <laughs> um then um i'm looking at where i am that person myself in which area of my life do I do exactly the same? And it just leaves the door open for a bit of compassion. So if I find um, I'm irritated by a friend or a colleague's uh, obsession about something or their behavior, um, I check myself, where am I, where do I do that? Who do I do that with? Why is it getting to me? You know? And so the fighting of one's beliefs maybe mars says you should always be fighting to change your beliefs or growing developing them fighting with you know um doing battle with your own beliefs so they never they never go unquestioned that may be part of the journey of the mars jupiter person yeah that may be super important with mars jupiter <clears throat> vicky spends a lot of money on different hobbies mars in the second square jupiter in the fifth great great pour it in enjoy it um and um robert if, if it's going to be a decent thing please say um what if you have neptune conjunct mars square jupiter says kim yeah well that energy of mars jupiter if neptune's involved remember the outer planets demand that we do something that we that we um give of ourselves in a different way so if you've got Mars Jupiter, there's a pile up of energy to get things done. Neptune says, don't sacrifice it, don't give it. So it goes down the plug hole and your energy is wasted. Give it to a cause, give it to an ism, something that you feel passionately or religiously about, Mars Jupiter. So put that fighting energy 
into a Neptunian, productive Neptunian pursuit. It could be through painting, it could be through music, dance, it could be through charity work, helping the underprivileged. I know you do that as well with your, um, I know it's your second house, Kim, and you do that very well with um, helping helping others. You mentioned this in the most recent class um, and going into centers on helping people. So Neptune demands ideally that we take that Mars-Jupiter energy and really explore it, explore it into, um, into a realm where it's for the greater good. It has higher purpose. It's an outer planet, a higher octave, higher purpose. Uh, so when you've got that, but it's tied into an outer planet, devote it to something. Devotion is such a great Neptune word, I think, as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you. Thanks, um, Kim, for that. Um, okay. So Nicholas says, is Sun conjunct Jupiter? Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> I can't see it now. Here we go. Um, okay. Is Sun conjunct Jupiter like being born under a lucky star? Um, I hope so. Um, I don't think it is. Sun Jupiter generally is um uh sun jupiter is um often about being associated with people who are powerful influential um who know the people that can get you contact jupiter is often the planet of promotion publicity sun jupiter people are often in the right place at the right time or with the right people or they happen to be you know you live next door to somebody who's who can help you with your work or your job or et cetera, that sort of thing, yeah? Um, and, and so the, um, that's, uh, that's key. I think that's key to it, uh, Sun Jupiter. Being, being born under a lucky star, I don't think there is any lucky combination, any lucky planetary position or, or placement. Um, everything can be turned into something helpful and useful, hopefully. Um, uh, in, um, uh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, let's get rid of Robert. There we are. Um, and, um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's, um, I don't think there's a lucky planet. I mean, Jupiter is supposed to be the lucky planet, uh, but what it does, it gives you something for nothing. And what you do with that is how you work with your own luck, how you, whether you turn, uh, that luck or that into an opportunity, whether you turn it into something useful. Yeah. So you make your own luck, really. And Jupiter is often the door opening or the hand extended to you. But whether it's actually uh, lucky or being born under a lucky star, mm, um, if it, you know, how you perceive your chart is key to how you succeed with your chart. Now, if you think you've got a negative Venus or one that will never attract love or money, believe me, that will be your viewpoint, how you see the world um, as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll ask Mario to let's have a look if we can get rid of Mike Ross. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, I will try, Levain asked about Mercury, Neptune. Okay, uh, Megan says, I've got some trying Jupiter. I don't seem luckier than other people necessarily, but when things go my way, when I get good opportunities, it always happens from being in the right place at the right time. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's, um, that puts it more succinctly than I did. And it's often not from conscious action on my part. It's a result of some small thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that feels very Jupiterian, some trying Jupiter. Yeah, right place, right time, right situation. Oh, that was nice. Um, but it doesn't last. Jupiter, you can make last by investing some Saturn commitment into it. Jupiter's like a big fat ball of opportunity that knocks on your door. And if you don't open the door and run with him, he's gone. He's gone on to another door. Yeah, he's gone on to another house to knock on to. Okay, Lorraine asked about Mercury Neptune. Okay, let's take a look at Mercury Neptune. <clears throat> Mercury Neptune. 
Now, if I've missed any of your requests, I know a couple of you asked about a few things. Um, email me, because I'm not obviously able to read everything coming up. Mercury, Neptune, okay. Um, you know, if you've got strong Mercury, Virgo, Gemini, planets, planets in those signs, and you have a Mercury, Neptune, you still gotta to learn to, to be at a, on a different rhythm. Yeah? If you're gonna try and do the Virgo of the systematic order, everything in its place, the I's dotted, the T's crossed, that's not going to work if you've got a Mercury, Neptune. Neptune says it's got to come from a different source. It's got to come, uh, uh, it's got to come from somewhere else. If you try to sort of micromanage something, Neptune says everything is too vast. You will lose yourself if you try to just focus on one little piece of the jigsaw. So you do find Mercury, Neptune in charts of people who got strong Virgo. And I say to them, yet yeah, do the preparation of the Virgo and then run wild with the Neptune. You know, take your, it's a bit like setting up the holiday and then just running around on the beach all week or, or doing all your emails in the morning and then spending the afternoon painting. That's like Mercury and then Neptune or Virgo and then Neptune. Or it could be the other way around. You do your Neptune and then you finish the jobs that need to be done at the end of the day. Yeah. Now, Nina says, is Mercury Neptune the same as Mercury and Pisces? To some extent, Mercury Neptune is a planetary dynamic. It's going to come up very powerfully in the chart, in the life. If you've got a major aspect, particularly conjunction square or position between them, it's going to come up powerfully in the life. Mercury and Pisces is a way of expression. Um, so they've got a lot in common, but Mercury and Neptune, in a sense, I would say is um, even more uh life defining or determining in a sense um sophia sophia might say, says um mercury try neptune also opposite saturn yeah that, that hopefully will give you the discipline hopefully it won't give you the well there's no point in trying i might as well give up when we've got saturn and neptune working it could be inspired dedication or it could be well Everything, the whole world is run by aliens and um, reptiles, and there's no point in doing any changing anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there's there may be that feeling of well, it's about the system, Saturn, Neptune, um, but ideally, it's you know, on a on a higher level, it's going to be about well, I can change what I can change, and I'll do it with an inspired dedication, Saturn, Neptune. Yeah, um, but often we just say well the government wins in the end, or they're going to win anyway. And that's, we're sort of giving up to the system, Saturn, Neptune. Yeah, there's that feeling um, with that. Okay. Uh, Cindy says, I've got the Saturn, Neptune opposition. I can go either way. And maybe depending on who you're in relationship with, which friend or partner or family member, Cindy as well, because the opposition will come out, that Saturn, Neptune will come out powerfully in uh in the um in relationships yeah so ideally you i say waking up from the dream with saturn neptune but we don't want to not dream and we don't want to be so serious that we or we think that all dreaming is a waste of time saturn but sometimes we have to wake up from the dream we have to know what's reality we have to dream the dream and then we say okay or as that famous book what was it after enlight, you know, enlightening, then the laundry. There's some sort of book that has that in its title. It's a bit like, you know, you've got to, you can search for enlightenment, but you've got to do the laundry too. That's Saturn Neptune speaking as well, you know. And the idea that we're all going to feel pain, but whether we choose to suffer in an ongoing way and for that to define who we are is a choice. Yeah. There is suffering, there is pain, whether it becomes a full-time job, a full-time uh, uh, way of being is another thing as well. Oh, thank you, um, Maria. Yes, after the ecstasy, the laundry. Thank you. It's not the enlightenment. After the ecstasy, the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, it takes work sometimes, Jesse says, to with Mercury Neptune, to know what's real. Yeah, well, 
you could go into a rabbit hole. I think if we think of talking of rabbit holes, if we think of um, Alice in the Alice in Wonderland, Alice through the Looking Glass, it's very Mercury Neptune. Yeah, everything is uh, de maybe deceptive, unreal. Um, it could be the reality, and I think Mercury Neptune people know. If we go back to ne Mercury Neptune. Mercury and Neptune people know that actually reality is just a form of Mercury. It's just a, a point of view. It's just a viewpoint. Yeah? A bit like the ascendant in the chart. If you go out into the world expecting people to betray you, you will meet the people that you either inspire to betray you or who will betray you anyway. It's a bit like being suspicious of people. You end up being suspicious of people they'll act suspiciously because they feel suspected. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so the Mercury, Nep think of Mercury, think of the ascendant as the lens, how you see the world, how it sees you, the two-way lens, but Mercury is also how we interpret that lens, how we, um, how we try to make, how we try to fit the jigsaw, jigs jigsaw pieces together of that lens, yeah. Um, so that, to me, that's the key. And we know that we are only ever seeing our so-called reality from our pair of eyes. We never have a really true concept of how anybody else feels or sees life or sees things or sees us. us. None of that. It's so subjective. Um, and Mercury Neptune sort of understands that, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to zoom up a little bit further. Um, Mercury, Saturn. Okay. Hi, Lynn. There must have been another Lynn that was upsetting everybody. Okay. Um, what about Mercury, Saturn? Again, that's a, a one that's given a tough reputation, but I love Mercury, Saturn, um, except what they do to themselves. I have a friend of mine who has Mercury conjunct Saturn in Pisces, so the sort of scapegoat feeling of Saturn plus Pisces, and so brilliant, so intelligent. I've got here, I think I've got specialist training, yeah. It's a bit like, have you, have you ever seen the um, television show Mastermind, where the person has to answer the question on their specialist subject, and then they do the general knowledge, and... Mercury Saturn can be the specialist training, the specialist subject. Yeah. And I um so I admire that, but they're so hard on themselves. Yeah, Janet's got Mercury Square Saturn, or asking about it at least. And very hard on themselves, always comparing, always contrasting, um, hearing that they might have done something wrong. Mercury Saturn. And again, that's part of the script they have to tear up. And I, I'm, I'm delighted to see that my friend Lynn, uh, Lynn Beale is here, Lynn Wilson, um, or was here, I think she's still, oh, she was here. Um, and uh, because um, she was teaching me all about script and how to uh, tear that up. We wrote an article about that. I think that's in the free, free interpretation and articles. So Mercury and Capricorn is a bit like that too. Uh, but Mercury Saturn is the, the weight of opinion and learning to have your own, yeah? going from that idea with Saturn, with Pluto, we learn to feel, feel we've, we're powerless, we learn to feel powerful. With Saturn, we feel ignorant or at the mercy of other people's specialism or intelligence or knowledge. And then eventually we become masters of our own specialist subject in that way. And we learn not to take anybody else's word as authority. We learn to develop our own insights, our own idea. But the problem with that is that it goes too far. Mercury Saturn at its best says, this is what I've learned so far. What are you learning? What can I learn from you? I'll teach you what I know if you teach me what you know. There can be that. Um, but Saturn, wherever it is in the chart, can get rigid it can get hard it can get too concrete and saturn needs to be the sort of um 
um, paving stone they have in children's parks. If somebody falls, it bends, it dips, it's soft. When satin becomes like concrete, it becomes the only way. Yeah, only way. And so Mercury Saturn might be, well, this is how I think this is the only way to think about something. And that's the great shame. So wherever we have our Saturn, we don't want to get so um, experienced that that is the only thing. It's a bit like, well, I don't want to read about that because it contradicts my point of view. <laughs> um, and we can all get a bit like that. I can get a bit like that when I start hearing people talk about um, certain types of um, uh, traditional astrology. This being, you know, in a difficult place or this being, um, you know, negative or whatever. And I think, oh, you know, and I actually I long to hear somebody speak eloquently and fluently and openly about these subjects um, instead of uh, feeling so black or white. Or this is I was at a lecture a while ago with somebody with a Mercury Saturn. And she said, so when you're dealing with Mar Mars and Saturn, the two malefics, you're either um in pain or punished it was something like that so i put my hand up for the back of the class and i and i said are there any other options <laughs> very gemini rising to do that excuse me any other any other options apart from pain and suffering or punishment yeah so we can all get a bit like that and we have to check ourselves but mercury saturn is about the gaining of experience and confidence with knowledge finding your voice not being so judgmental of what people might say or think. Oh, she's, you know, it's like 10 comments. One of them is slightly critical, and that's the one you fixate on. That can be Mercury Saturn, that could be Mercury Capricorn. Yeah? So it's important to sort of catch yourself do that and say, no, no, what about the nine? The nine positive ones or the seven positive ones. Yeah. Wisdom comes over time. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. All right, any others? Let's take a look. Um, early years holding back self-expression. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, yeah. Um, often there's a comparison with the sibling, if there is a sibling. Why didn't you do it like them? They got an A, you only got a C, that sort of thing. The shadow side of Saturn can be favoritism, where you realize actually somebody else's favorite and they haven't really deserved it that's probably the truth <laughs> um but there's an awareness of being compared to someone or something yeah okay all right have we got more porn okay let us know who it is thank you mm, oh dear all this porn i can't even watch it all right jupiter uranus okay well, okay we um okay you, um, let's Mercury, Mercury, Pluto, Jupiter, Uranus. Jupiter, Uranus, uh, sudden opportunities falling into our lap, unexpected growth. Here we go. Here are some key words about Jupiter, Uranus. Blessings in disguise. If I was a blessing, I wouldn't go in disguise, would you? Um, Jupiter, Uranus. The, the discovery that the world is this meaningful place, the discovery that things are um that there's more uranus is about discovery and jupiter is about more that great discovery wow wow i've just been so narrow and all of a sudden it's like coming out of a, a very narrow train um tunnel and then all of a sudden you've got the landscape that feels like jupiter uranus uh, wherever we have Uranus, there can be the only way, the right way, the need, all of that. Yeah. Um, Rhonda says, win a million, lose a million. Yes, it can be like that. That, uh, um, that feeling of, wow, what am I going to do? Oh, spend, 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 spend. Um, uh, the freedom from dogma, that, that idea that being able to um, not get rigid about the only way to do something. Yeah. This is the perfect way. Well, there are, you know, each each way is perfect for the person themselves. You know? um, there's not only one astrology, that sort of thing. Yeah? Uranus likes to say this is the perfect one. This is the system that works. This is the breakthrough. This is going to change your life. This is the only thing. This is the only diet that will ever work in your life. <laughs> sort of YouTube adverts you get while you're just about to watch the good bit. 
and then somebody sells you something and you think, okay, now you've told me that I'm definitely not buying from you. Um, so Jupiter Uranus has a great adventurous feeling to it, particularly if it's around the angles of the chart, whether it's uh, conjunct or, or square or opposite the inner planets, it's going to be speaking in a personal way. Otherwise, it just might be what was going on in the news in your life, if it's not doing much in your chart, or it might be occasional uh, windfalls or sudden changes or, say, lucky accidents. Um, okay. Um, Sudden growth. Thank you, Kim. Um, I know Sue Tompkins used to relate Jupiter Uranus to cancer cells because they were um, unusual cells, different cells that were growing, you know. And again, please don't read that in any way to suggest Jupiter Uranus is linked in your chart to cancer. But it, she was using the symbolism of that foreign cell, that unusual thing that grows. Um, and maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that. Anyway, so Mercury Pluto. Yes, you've been determined there, uh, Renata, uh, put that in there, Mercury, sorry, Mercury, Pluto. Let's take a look at Mercury, Pluto. Here we go. And that's one of the great things about Mercury, Pluto is their concentration, their ability to keep, <laughs> to keep writing in the chat box to remind me, Mercury, Pluto, determination in that sense. Um, you know, I want a strong Pluto person in my life, if I want to have somebody by my side through thick and thin, through fat and thin, shall I say, through chocolate and bouts without chocolate. Um, yes, we've got the idea of the detective. Thank you, Cecile. We've got the idea of um, always suspicious of motive, always questioning. Yeah? Now, if you're like me, I've got Mercury, Pluto. I'm also a Gemini rising. I'm always thinking about the other point of view, the other idea. The, what's on the other hand? Tell me about this. What's, but Mercury, Pluto is super suspicious. Yeah? What's really going on here? Yeah? I'm going to be careful conjuring up too, Mercury, too much Mercury Pluto after what we had half an hour ago. Um, neurosurgeon, says um, Nicoletta. Um, speaking truth to power. Thank you, Susan. Yes, exact Mercury Pluto opposition. Speaking truth to power. Yes, having the power to change things with your voice, with a single voice, Mercury Pluto. So many of the people in the public eye that sell in, you know, have written influential books or written influential songs, a very moon Pluto or Mercury Pluto, because there's a, there's a compulsiveness there, but there's also a determination to really change how people perceive things. And, you know, Mercury, some of you may disagree with this, but I, um, I know one of you may, um, but I think of Mercury and the moon as the different halves of the brain. You could look at them as sun and moon. I like to think of the parts of the brain as um, moon and Mercury. And the Mercury and moon are both different parts of the brain for different functions. The moon is obviously linked to memory and, and that sort of connection um, and habit. And Mercury is more to do with um, uh, putting the pieces together and language. Uh, etc. But they're both with Moon Pluto and Mercury Pluto, both fascinated with secrets. Um, learning astrology from the age of 16, I started to hear people's secrets. People would tell me stuff that they wouldn't tell anybody else. And that was power in a sense of feeling trusted, but also understanding that somebody coming to see you um, and you think they've got a particular lifestyle, may have a completely different perspective or lifestyle. And that's the under understanding of Mercury Pluto. I often say as well that if you have siblings, Mercury Pluto often have siblings that are, have been through trauma or drama or something extreme. And you're the sibling, if you've got Mercury Pluto, you may see that in your siblings, drama and ex extreme behavior, compulsions, different things. But your ability to know that knowledge is power and to keep silent is the key. And I often think that people with Mercury Pluto are often observers in childhood, observing what isn't said, but in the family, the hidden messages in between, reading between the lines, and knowing that if they said the truth and they said the emperor's got no clothes on, 
and stuck, stuck up their hand and really revealed the truth, it could destroy things. So Mercury, Pluto go through life being very aware of the power to destroy with their words. It's the poison pen letter writer. It's the person that will um, get to the heart of something. It's like a poison dart that you might, it's like a Bond movie where you, so the villain blows and it sticks into somebody's neck and all of a sudden, you know, they're dead. It's a Mercury Pluto dart. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and yes, knowing that what you say can change people's lives and therefore knowledge is power, it's sacred and we have to be super careful how we use it. Yeah, um, that's, you know, and I've got here finally empowered or persecuted by ideas. That's interesting. You know, Pluto is where we persecute ourselves or where we felt persecuted in life. Yeah. Okay. Um, or, and hopefully where we started to feel more empowered. You know, where we've got Pluto. I have a client of mine at the moment with Pluto on the IC. His father had a temper. His mother was a psychotherapist, very powerful Scorpio woman. And his father was a um, deeply moon Pluto emotional man. And there was that fear with Pluto on the IC that any, any moment there could be an eruption between the parents and something could change and never go back. And it was all, they were always blowing up. The parents were always threatening to leave each other. And the, and the child, my client, who's an adult now, always very aware that fear, that Pluto fear deep down in, on the IC everything could be wiped away from me. So you get the makings of a control freak. <laughs> and I use that phrase uh, respectfully, because I'm one of those as well. Uh, not Pluto on the IC, but I'm a control freak. And um, it's the makings of somebody that needs to control or needs to have power over things, over their environment. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Lynn says, my sister has this. She was verbally cruel and jealous of me. Yeah. Play, um, yeah. Um, Kim would tell students examples of um, her own she's got a mercury in scorpio conjunct neptune and she and her sister never got on or as children as sisters often don't unfortunately and she used to poison her sister just ever so slightly put in um uh, per, per, sort of toxic things into the into the water uh, it was very very mercury in scorpio conjunct neptune <laughs> all right <clears throat> Passionate writing. Thank you, Kathy. The ability to rip somebody to the core, really get to the heart of something, to penetrate with the words. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. Across the signs. Okay, good question, Greg. So if you've got Mercury, Pluto, but they're in different signs, they're still Mercury, Pluto. Some people wouldn't consider that a conjunction. I would. As long as they're within eight degrees, really. And that's a point I want to make in a moment. Um, is that even <clears throat> if they're in different signs next door to each other, they're going to um, you're going to have there's going to be a bit more interpretation to bring into it. There's going to be more areas of life that they encompass. That's just how it is. That's how it is. So um, my my feeling with that. Let's have a look. Um, okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. Um, my feeling with that is that you just think Mercury, Pluto, and you think of the signs involved and think of these are the areas that could be obsessed about, but they're usually two instead of one. That, that's really like the opposition. You have to think about that. Even if it's out of sign, you have to think about how they may work together. Um, Pluto, you know, Virgo and Libra are signs about doing the right thing. They're good manners goody two-shoes, trying to be perfect, trying to please people, trying to look after people. Um, these are things that you may really want to get to the heart of and say, screw that, screw those manners, screw having to be polite just for the sake of it. Mercury of Pluto wants to say, cut this bullshit, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, let me just head back a little bit. Um, Venus, Mars, could you make it more visible? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's put that there for a minute then, Venus, Mars. 
um, often triangles with Venus Mars. It's Venus Mars people, it brings out the competition, the competitive instinct. It's a strange thing because, you know, they're next door to each other, Venus Mars, by sign and in the pantheon. Um, I mean, I know Earth is in between, but uh, astrologically they're next door to each other. And there's some, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said that planets that are next door to each other tend to influence each other. The hierarchy generally says that if you're a sun Pluto, it's Pluto that influences the sun. The outer planet influences the inner. But when they're next door, like Jupiter, Saturn, Jupiter does a bit to Saturn, Saturn does a bit to Jupiter. Same with Venus and Mars. So Venus can soften the competitive instinct or Mars can make um, the relationship life a competitive arena, for example. Yeah, and probably a bit of both. Wherever we have planets, wherever they are in our charts, there'll be points in our lives where, you know, one part of your life will be Venusian, the other will be, will be Mars. And that may swap and change sometimes. It's a bit like we were looking at Saturn, Neptune earlier. Saturn, Neptune people usually very structured in one area of their lives and totally chaotic in another. It's like you go to their office, it's completely organized. There are shelves and A to Z for everything. You go home, it looks like a bomb site. <laughs> um, so there can be that Saturn discipline and just letting go. Uh, same, with, you know, same with any combination. There can be a surprising quality. So it could be that they're very competitive in relationships, but also there's a soften a softened quality in another area as well yeah but very interesting combo anybody got that that want to share anything in the chat box um okay christian ronaldo has got that okay um set so, you know it's interesting mars and venus just i don't know much about ronaldo uh but mars and mars and venus are obviously the sex symbols of the of the of, the, of astrology and what the public seems to like is a man with a strong Venus and a woman with a strong Mars. That's what seems to be the key in the charts of sex symbols. Yeah. You sometimes get the Marilyn Monroe, who was very Venusian, very Neptunian. Yeah. And she's different from that. But you tend to get the sex symbols like Angelina Jolie, very moon Mars, Jupiter in Aries on the MC. And then you get the softer David Beckham's Taurus with Taurus rising, Mars in Pisces, a lot softer Venusian dynamic. So we seem to like our men to be Venusian as sex symbols and women to be Mars-like as sex symbols. Um, I've noticed not all, not across the board, but often. Okay. Uh, let's take a look. Blending of the masculinity and the feminine. Yeah, of, of the masculine and feminine. Thank you, Kathy. Yes. And nowadays, of course, we're looking at all of that, that simple dynamic. Um, as It's really exploding with people just swapping forth, getting new perspectives on these two. We're really looking at very um, diverse and divergent expressions of Venus and Mars uh, in the world at the moment with how people are expressing their gender, their identity. It's really, whatever you think of it, whatever whatever you've heard or wrapped up in it, it's, it's a fascinating time in history of what people are doing. So I'm fascinated by that at the moment. Okay, Lorraine had some Venus square Mars. Always feel like I need to win somebody's love. Thank you, Christina. That's really interesting, yeah. The winning of it. What happens when you win it? Do you need to fight and fall out and then make love again? I don't know. You know, there's something about when, when have you won <laughs> with Venus Mars? Do you need to keep winning, keep arguing? Need, it's a bit, um, something about the Venus Mars wants to throw a bomb into something and explode it if it gets too boring, gets too comfortable. Venus is like a lazy day out in in the sun, you know, bring me a pina colada, make sure you put the umbrella in it and a bit of um, pineapple and I can sit there and relax. And 
and all of a sudden you sort of want to get edgy or have a row or, or be dynamic. You know, Venus Mars needs that uh, tension. But sometimes it should be the other way too. When you've got that tension, remember to laugh, to relax, to make love, to have fun, to spend money, to go, you know, to pleasure yourself, whatever it is, it should be the other way too. But we tend to go from Venus to Mars and rarely from Mars to Venus. So anyway, some ideas about that. Um, Cecile is, me, is dating someone at the moment with Mars venus connection between the two charts yes there's going to be a definite chemistry chemistry and look at the dynamic of that look at who is throwing you're being selfish the accusation of that or who's doing too much who's instigating who's taking the lead have a play enjoy the dynamic back and forth um rather than it becoming a, a source of tension in a in a negative way of course yeah now, Joy, hi, Joy, says um, Venus, Mars, quintile. Now, I don't know much about the quintile aspect. Give me a couple of years. I'll come back to you after doing some research on the quintile. But I do know from what Faye Blake says. Uh, Faye wrote a great book I was just looking at today called, um, uh, called um, Vocational Astrology. And she looks at the quintile in terms of the talent and the biquintile. So that's pretty much all I know about the quintile is that there's a, a talent um, that's supposed to be reflective of the talent, but I don't know enough about that yet. <clears throat> what I do want to add at this moment. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. Thanks for your kind comments. After all that madness mid midstream, it's nice to get everyone back and it will we can all focus again and not be uh, upset by it all. Um, yes, thank you, Lynn. Yes, I will. Yes. OK. <laughs> um, all right, what I want to say to you, when you look at your chart, have a look at the aspect, Venus, Mars, Sun, Saturn, whatever, and look at the number of degrees of the orb. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, have a look at, let me just share the chart of today with you, okay? So um, say you've got a moon, Mars square. There's a moon, Mars applying square in the sky tonight. <laughs> That's probably the beginning of it all. Um, now, can you see that it's about six degrees apart? Does everyone see that? The moon is at two Virgo, Mars is at eight Gemini. They're six degrees apart. Doesn't matter which one is two, which one is eight, but they're six degrees apart. Now, those of you who know that I do a lot of work in solo art directions will know that the degrees between any two aspects, the orb, in this case, six degrees, is the year of life that it manifests in the life. Yeah. So the moon, Mars, in this case, if this is somebody born tonight at the age of six, they're going to experience moon Mars very vividly. OK, which leads us to an interesting point. And that is all the aspects in our grid that we print off when we start looking at our charts at the very beginning of astrology and we look at that triangle and all the different aspect grids. If you use an eight degree orb for the major aspects or even 10 degrees, all your early solar arcs are written in that grid. So if you've got a moon square Mars, you live with moon Mars. Your moon Mars will be apparent in your life, throughout your life, from Virgo to uh, to Mar to Gemini, <clears throat> but if you really want to understand the makings of that aspect, look at the year that they perfected by solar arc. In this case, six degrees, six years. Okay, so you might have a Sun Uranus square that's three degrees apart. The age of three. Now you may not remember them, but investigate. Look at that. If it was very precise, it's going to happen just maybe weeks after your birth. You could even do what we call converse and look at six years before your life or six months before your life, whatever, whatever the aspect is. You could look before, your, before you were born, too, if you wanted to. So herein lies an ability to really help clients understand the aspect. So if a client came to me and said, look, we started talking about the moon Mars and they 
I, you know, maybe I spoke about an ability to think quickly, to react quickly, moon, Mars, maybe to get angry quickly. It's in Virgo and Gemini. And those are signs that are usually quite irritable or crotchety sometimes. I speak from experience. Um, and moon, Mars, Virgo, Gemini, trying to get an explanation of that. You might say to them, do you remember the age of six? Do you remember what was going on at that time? And they might say, oh, no, no, I don't know. Then you leave it with them, or they might write to you later, or they might think about it later, or they might even give it to you later, which they often do. They might say, well, that hasn't happened since six or something. And they are, oh, okay, let's talk about that age. Now they remember. And all of a sudden you've got an event in their lives that may not necessarily be the source, but it's certainly a reference point to try and help them understand how to make the very most of that aspect. Now, the moon Mars might have been a sudden emergency at home. There might have been, um, if it was in fire signs or connected to fire or something, it might have been a fire or a burn, the child got burned or something, perhaps, at that age. And it might be that since then, they've been very cautious. And moon Mars is not really about being cautious. But what they learned at the age of six, when the moon and Mars finally got together one way or the other, doesn't matter who was directing to who, but just the fact they're six degrees apart means they come together at the age of six um, by square in this case, we can give them the, the person a reference to saying, ah, so have you been cautious since then? Have you always been fearful instead of followed your gut instinct? And the moon Mars person really should follow their instinct, should act upon Mars, their instinct. Yeah. And so if they haven't done that or something happened to them at that age that stopped them doing that, addressing that, bringing that up, is going to be an interesting exercise in a consultation. Um, or even in your own life, of course, looking at it. We learn so much more from our own charts to understand. Now, um, I have a Sun Uranus and a sun, a sun, a sun Venus opposite Uranus, about three or four degrees opposite. And the age of three or four, my parents discovered that I was deaf and I had to wear hearing aids. And if I go back to this feeling of alienation, of having to wear these NHS hearing aids of the loop behind the ear and everybody staring at me and, and feeling very, very different. I can understand that that's a sun Venus opposite Uranus, looking different, feeling different, feeling alienated away from other people. Now, that's in my life all the time. I use it in all sorts of ways, that aspect. Yeah? But if I go back to that early age and link it to an event, it makes me understand a lot more about where that may have started, or at least some of the roots to that as well. Okay. Now, Jesse asks, how flexible would you be? I give them half a degree orb. So I'm just going to show you very briefly um, how we do this. Okay. I'm just going to move it. So we've got two wheels now very quickly. I'm just going to move it. So this is inner wheel is now, the outer wheel is now, and I'm going to move it forward. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to change that. I'm going to change it to something else. There we go. There we are. All right. Um, so, uh, oh, oh, that's what it is. Rhonda will tell me I'm doing this wrong. Okay. That's why. Okay. So I'm just going to show you for a moment uh, how that might work. Okay. So here's Mars. And if we move forward, oh shit, not going to show me. Okay. I forget this. Um, not so easy on here anymore. Um, all right. Anyway, so uh, I've moved forward a year now. Here we go. Um, the moon by solar arc will move six degrees up to eight degrees Virgo here, and it will square that Mars 
And that's what will happen with the solo arc. Okay. I realize in Astro Gold, if I'm using it as a transit, I can't move it forward that easily. Anyway, um, I am doing a solo art day at the end of the month. Those of you interested in looking at your own solo arts, we've got a whole whole day full of your examples and working with them and learning how to master them. So please do look at that if you want to. Uh, I think it's a Saturday the 28th. Okay, let's go back. So I use half a degree uh, to answer your question, Jess. I was going to show you. I'll have to not show you. Um, half a degree uh, before and after exactitude. Roughly six years old. Some people say, oh, well, it was five and a bit. Okay. It was five and a bit, you know, uh, but usually half a degree, half a year either side. OK, thanks, Carolyn. Yes. OK. Um, um, Nikki says, would it be important to age six, 12, 18? No, just at six. That's when they come together. They'll come together again in a hard aspect another 90 years later. Because it takes so long to go through. I will show you that on the 28th, I promise. OK. It is Nikki. I think you can get it on. Um, I'm actually just finishing the ebook at the moment. Those of you that prefer ebooks. Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> let's take a look at a few more examples. There was a uh, in bold um, something about Uranus. Lynn, what was it? Um, oh, Uranus Mars. Okay. Let's take a look at some keywords. <coughs> Excuse me. For Uranus, Mars, Mars, Uranus. Okay, well, we, if we know it's in Cancer, it obviously can be in, it'll be in every sign because Uranus will spend six and a half to seven and a half years in each sign, and Mars will come round um, every couple of years to that sign if they're conjunct, of course, but they can be in other signs. Mars Yuan is in Cancer in Lynn's case. Um, it's going to be something about the home, about the mother, about the family, about doing things differently as a woman, making choices that perhaps were a lot more independent. Mars and Uranus are the, I want to say individuality planets. Uranus isn't about individuality. The sun and Mars are about individuality. The person, the center, the military leader, Mars, the monarch the sun. Uranus is about um, getting wrapped up in a cause, in wrapped up in something that you want to speak for, an ism in that way. Um, it's actually not very individual. When you've got 20,000 people on a march fighting for freedom, there's nothing individual about that. But that person may go home and they're the one individual that is fighting for transgender rights or vegan rights or against the war or whatever it may be yeah so in a way uranus the idea is anything but individual and the coming together is a group consciousness and sun and mars are the individuality so when you get sun uranus or mars uranus you get an individuality that's linked very much to trying to wake people up to get people thinking outside of the system outside of the box but we know we may feel different but when we sit here in a group of 230 people uh, luckily minus a few uh, disrupting people um we we're, we're no longer uranium in that sense we're no longer on the outside we're talking our language we're mingling we're connecting in that way mars uranus is the thrill seeker by solo arc, it's the one aspect that I think I say to my clients, I wouldn't normally say this, but be careful. Don't go hang gliding. Don't go jumping off a cliff in the next few months. You know, Mars Uranus, is there's a need for excitement, but there's also taking risks and sometimes not judging those risks carefully. Yeah. So I'm always, I, that's why I put here accident prone. Um, it's not promising an accident. Nothing promises anything by solo arc or by transit. It doesn't work like that. Uh, but it does mean that that try to understand your need for speed or your need for excitement at this point <coughs> during this transit or during this um, the need to be explosive, the need to tell your boss or your family to go take a hike understand it and do it in a way, if you need to do it, do it in a way that works for you. Uranus is the most extreme of the planets. 
we think Pluto's extreme. Uranus is more extreme, extremer, er, er, <laughs> because it doesn't have the emotional attachment of Pluto. You know, Uranus says, to hell with you, goodbye, everybody. I'm going off, um, moving house, changing my name and living on the other side of the world. You'll never see me again. That's how extreme Uranus can be. You know, Pluto is extreme in another way. You know, Pluto says, I'm with you, you're mine. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Pluto is the godfather. It makes you an offer you can't refuse. But Uranus has an energy about it that is um, uh, uh, powerfully abrupt, cutting, breaking, um, eliminating in that sense, without emotion. So we have to be super careful with Uranus in our charts, not to get rid of everything. When I say to you know, having a Uranus transit, somebody says to me, I just want to leave every, I, I want to go, I said, well, change a little bit, just this week. Change, um, to, you know, do what, it, first of all, do what you need to do. If you want to do it, do it. But if it's going to work against you, then change your schedule. Start this week by doing something different. Um, talk to your boss about doing four days instead of five days or convert the room in the in the top of the house into an office so you've got some space for yourself. There's a need for space with Uranus transits. And if you're Mars Uranus, Moon Uranus, Sun Uranus, you're going to know about that individual need for space. It's super, super important. And always you're going to be feeling Saturn in your life. People are going to feel narrow, um, judgmental, restrictive, um, unable to see beyond, unable to wake up to the truth. Um, we're going to feel irritable with the whole world at different times of our lives. <laughs> um, and with the Uranus transit, we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think somebody wrote that a bit earlier. Um, and not to get rid of everything that could benefit us. Getting rid of all your friends because you're sick of how you are as a friend, you know, changing them instead of changing you um, is, a, is an issue. Yeah? So change you, change your immediate surroundings with Uranus transits or Uranus directions. Uh, and... Um, work up towards the big changes. That's, that's often what I say to my clients. Uh, but then some of them want to make big changes. And you know, I, that's the last thing I do is stop them from that either. So yes, it's a powerful combo, um, but they're both planets of speed. Yeah? They're both planets that are fiery in the sense of reactive. You know, Uranus will cut you off, Mars will strike you down. Yeah? Um, rejection is a big one with Moon Uranus and Mars Uranus. Sensitivity to, to, sensitivity to that and a reaction to that. Yeah? In a way, with our Moon and our Mars placements, we actually want to be a little bit more responsive rather than just reactive. You know, like, ah, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. That's the Moon and our Mars talking from a very primal energy on a different level, it's about contemplating and responding in a way that benefits you, benefits um, the situation, and perhaps benefits the person that is, um, is also involved as well. So re being responsive instead of reactive, I think is a key thing. Okay. <clears throat> Uranus in cancer, foster care, yes, doing things differently. Mars Uranus people don't like to be told. One of the great examples of Mars square Uranus, Mars in Taurus, square Uranus in Leo is Madonna. And she really appealed back in the 1980s and still to this day, she really appealed to the teenager that didn't want to be told what to do. And she was a young woman saying, screw this, very Mars Uranus. You, you often have to use reverse psychology on a Mars Uranus person and say to them, well, that's the last thing I do, if that's what you want them to do. <laughs> that's the thing you have to do sometimes, perhaps, particularly if you've got a Mars Uranus child that's incredibly willful. Um, when I look at children's charts for parents, and I do that very carefully, um, and if I notice a Mars Uranus, I'll say, um, or even a Mars Pluto, I said, be careful about getting into stubborn standoffs with your child, because they'll probably win. 
and they'll leave you embarrassed in front of everybody at the airport because they won't move. And I'm not moving and I don't mind. Okay, they'll, they've got less to lose or less to worry about uh, the consequent, worrying about the consequences of that. So um, Mars Uranus can be incredibly willful and it's best to appeal to their intelligence and Uranus is about, you know, well, it's about fairness. It's about equality. The ideals of Uranus are about actually, I thought you were trying to give everybody a fair go here. That's what I would say to provoke a Mars Uranus into maybe not feeling attacked, but feeling that they they need to consider an alternative rather than just be stubborn. Yeah, but it depends on the signs they're in as well. In Cancer, as Lynn asked about, there um, was going to be a you know that was the generation of women who started to have everything from different kitchens and different households and different setups uh, to um, Uranus in Cancer was the first I Love Lucy show in America, changing the face of comedy, domestic comedy, um, domestic uh, you know, situations that are funny and outrageous. And it, um, I think it did a lot to uh, particularly make the women of that generation decide they didn't have to follow when they moved, when they grew up in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have to follow other um, existing ways of being a mother, being a woman, being a wife, having two options of a career instead of a multitude of them. So maybe, maybe it's all of those things. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Melody Ann. Yes, in my solo art book, I look at Christopher Reeve, and he's a he's a Mars something. It was a Mars Uranus thing. Uh, with Christopher Reeve. I forget now exactly what it was, but it was a double whammy. And um, Christopher Reeve, one of the few celebrities I actually shed a tear over when he died, because I thought that was such a terrible waste of potential. And I really thought he was going to get out of that wheelchair and walk, um, but but didn't. So anyway, yes, um, Mars Uranus, I'm, I've seen it too often now in terms of accidents, looking at famous moments of accident. So I'm always very cautious. Uh, direct your energy into changing your life rather than looking for, you know, be the change you want to see in the world rather than go out there and jump out of a plane, change the, the, the situation with your partner or with your job or with your family or do something that is proactive rather than risk taking. That's what I would suggest. There's always time for risks and fun and jumping out of planes. Okay, all right. <laughs> We're going to finish in a few minutes. Um, Saturn conjunct Uranus. Well, I'm going to leave you with that one there just to take a look at Saturn Uranus. Um, I love this one. Oh, yes, here we go. After enlightenment, the laundry. Okay, thank you. I did have it somewhere. Um, I love this. I I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. I love that. That's Angela Davis, very Saturn Uranus. I think she was born at the conjunction, I think and a very Saturn Uranus chart. Um, I love that. And so, you know, we talk about having the wisdom to know the difference between what we can and cannot change, but the idea of changing the things you can't accept in life, um, very powerful Saturn Uranus combination, being born with that um, are, are the changes of the future. The people born with it in the early forties, people born with it in the late 80s, I think it was, um, and at different times in the um, in, yeah, um, fascinating group of people who are going to change the system. Um, very powerful. Okay, okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Does it slow down them down if they're retrograde? No, I don't think um, planets get slower if they're retrograde in terms of the natal chart expression. Good question, Nina. Thank you for that. Um, no, I'm, I'm doing a, and the astro detective. I'm doing a whole day on retrograde planets in the natal chart. So give me a few months. I'll have all the answers. <laughs> No, I won't. I won't have all the answers, but I'll have some answers. What I think about the retrogrades in the natal chart is that they appear early in life, they get put on hold, and then they come out for a second go, a second chance later. Saturn retrograde, you go to work young, you're very responsible as a child, and that gets put on hold, relationships, work, whatever. Later, you get to explore that Saturn in a better environment. Mercury retrograde, natally, 
there's a clue to what you're here to do early in your life. And then things just take over relationships, work, other people's needs, family, going to school, training, all of that. And then you get back. The retrograde means a second chance. Get back to recapture that Mercury talent. So you might have Mercury in Leo and you had a talent for acting or comedy or, or, or some sort of creative endeavor, uh, speaking up, speaking out. And um, you end up finding your voice later in a different capacity or reconnecting with an old talent. That's how I see retrogrades. Uh, early experience, pause, second chance. Yeah. Um, Cecile says, would you say trines and sextiles are less felt? Yes, I would. I think they're quieter in the chart. If you think of the chart as an orchestra, or you think of it as a, a big musical number, <laughs> um, then the conjunctions, squares, and oppositions are all uh, the powerful drums, the um, you know the beat, the guitars. They're the big instruments. The trines and the sextiles, the quincunxes, etc. They turn up. They might be featured. There might be a, a like a um, what do they call them? When the symbols when they they clash them. That's a dramatic moment in the score. But it's not part of something or something you will hear all the way through the composition. So minor aspects tend to show up at different times of life. Uh, usually when they're triggered by transit or solo arc uh, and the other softer aspects tend to be there but they're not attracting or demanding the attention with the sort of noise that the others are so i do prioritize them and this comes from the fact that from the age of 20 21 i was doing readings for um uh for charity fundraising different things <clears throat> and i was um I used to try and explain to people their sussy quadrates and their quincunxes, and they'd be looking at me like, what? And as soon as I spoke about their conjunction squares oppositions, they knew exactly what I was talking about. And we could work on those. Yes, it doesn't mean you can't work on the others. It was just when you've got an hour with somebody or an hour and a half, you want to really get to the essentials, the loudest things sometimes. Or sometimes you do want to go to the quieter parts of the chart and help them explore that. Uh, particularly if you, if it, happens that they're not using that part and they're longing to use it somebody with five planets in virgo but they've got venus in leo and they've got no relationship with their venus in leo and you might want to just work with that venus in leo and it might be sessi quadrate something you might just want to work with that aspect and sort of tease it out okay? um final note just about the solar arc on the 28th it's a day it's recorded it will be your chart examples it will be teaching about that but it's for a charity it's for a cancer charity for a, a friend of mine who lost her sister very recently um in australia and um, she was a nurse really helped a huge amount of people and then uh got got um cancer and died very very quickly so we're fundraising for the charity that really helped her and help other people so um it's as usual most of the time it's for a good cause um and uh if you want to sign up for that please feel welcome to do that it would be great to be able to give them a good amount of money from the day uh, and thanks to you and all your uh sign-ups over the last three, four years, we've, I think we've raised over 30,000 pounds. That's about $40,000 of um, money to different charities. Uh, well, hopefully worthwhile charities, people that really need it. Uh, animals, and um, children in particular, and uh, adults, um, everybody we can. So thank you for being part of that. And thank you for being part of tonight. Um, apologies for the rather bizarre disruption um and uh but anyway i should have seen that coming i'm sure somebody's going to tell me that you should, should have seen that in your chart <laughs> anyway it's been great thank you very much everybody i hope uh this has been useful tonight um i will upload these combinations as well we'll have a look at those tomorrow um and you'll find them in the free uh interpretations file that's in the freebies not in the freebies but in the free section of the website as well okay you take care thank you very much for being um part of tonight and uh i'll see you soon bye-bye